good morning. Like I said earlier, my name is Hayes, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here, and never in my life did I want to say that I had preached with a sling on, but I guess I can check that box off now. But, um, man, I am super humbled to be able to open God's Word with you today. And, and um, you know, my wife and I did college ministry for a long time before I was a pastor, before I got paid to do ministry, which is uh, the greatest job in the world. But we used to do college groups in our home, and it seemed like every group we had, there would be a couple of students or like a, a student, two students who were a couple. I said that last time, it was hard to explain what I was talking about, but we would connect to them really well. And I remember one of them, his name's Aaron Householder, her name is Sarah, they live in the Middle East doing ministry stuff now, but uh, when they were getting ready to get married, we... Uh, I was taking a group of guys, and we were going on a, a bachelor trip, and we were going to, Elizabeth's grandmother had a cabin, and it was, you had to cross the Black River in Arkansas, if you've ever been to Arkansas uh, very much, you probably have encountered the Black River between here and there, and um, now we knew it was at flood stage, but we were young and dumb and didn't care, and so we are driving, and it's getting dark. Everybody had to wait till we got off work, and so it's getting dark. And we come up on this roadblock, but it's not fully blocked. You know, it's like half of one of the blocks is kind of sitting, kind of cockeyed like that, and it says, road closed ahead. And I was like, yeah, we're going to chance it. I ignored it. And we kept going, and sure enough, about 10 miles in, we hit the actual roadblock, and there was no going past that one. And we had to alter our course, and we had to go back, and it took us like, two hours from that point to get to the farm, which should have taken about 25 minutes. Um, and let me just tell you, that sign was truthful. You know, they don't put road signs out that aren't truthful. And, but I sure ignored it like it wasn't truthful. And <clears throat> what happens is when you encounter truth like that, it changes the course that you're taking. Now, I'm grateful. That was a very kind thing for them to do to put a road sign up that was truthful that said, hey, you better be concerned there's a roadblock, but um, we still chose to ignore it. And I think when we look at what Scripture teaches, that the truth of the gospel, the truth of what the Bible teaches, it should transform us. It should change us. It should alter the way we live, the way we interact, the way we, uh, the way we speak to one another, the way that we talk to those we don't know, the way we pray. It should totally transform us. But I think a lot of times we focus so much on heaven or hell, right? We get focused on the end game rather than the here and now. And it's like, you know, if I had a pair of shoes that hurt my feet, I would change them. Not because there may be future damage to my feet, which could happen, but because every step that I took hurt. And I think that sometimes we, we miss what God has for us as believers in Jesus to glorify him by not walking with him every day, by not um, listening to that truth and letting it transform us every day because then that would allow us to glorify him, which is the ultimate goal of our lives. And so if we're not doing that, right, if we're not glorifying the Lord with our life, if we're not living every day for him, then it begs a question that what is the truth that we're believing then? Because there is truth that we're believing. Truth is what dictates where we're going and how we're getting there and everything that we choose to do is rooted in a level of truth. And so we have to ask ourselves, what truth am I listening to? And so today, I want to look at what Scripture says very clearly about that. And we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. We're just doing two verses. So you were here last time I preached, you'll probably be excited because I tend to go too long. And two verses is not that long. But you also took a while to get in here. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but while you're turning there, I want, to, I want to sort of tell you how we got here, how... how I got a phone call or a text message on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock and how we're now looking at this passage of Scripture. I've been reading with a discipleship group that we meet every week. Uh, Wednesdays at 5.30 we read Scripture together, we meet together, we go through life together. And we've been reading the book of 1 Kings, which is not a book that people typically open the Bible and say, I'm going to read. Right? Nobody, well maybe you do, but most don't go, I'm going to read 1 Kings today. Um, but it is such a powerful book. And I want to show you one verse that, was the, that spurred this whole thing from chapter 11 in verse 4. It says, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God as his father David had been. This is the first time that I think, I didn't dig deeply, but where 
David is referred to as somebody who is wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord. And you begin to think, if you're like me, maybe I'm just super cynical. When I think of David, one of two stories come to mind. Typically, the first one is Bathsheba, the sin, and then you got David and Goliath. But this is, David has died at this point in Scripture. And you see this repeated over and over again in the book of 1 Kings. That he was a man wholeheartedly devoted to God. And I began to wrestle with, what does that look like for us now in the New Testament age? Like, what does that look like? And as we've talked about this idea of reset and starting over with Christ, then, then I thought, man, we need to, sometimes we have to reset what I've called a truth life reset. Meaning that there should be a connection between the truth that we believe and the life that we live. And sometimes those get out of whack, and we have to step back and say, okay, I've got to reset this thing on what is true and how it is affecting how I live. And so we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. We're going to do the first two verses, but a little bit of context, because the first 11 chapters of Romans is a theological masterpiece. If you want to understand Christianity and its theology and the doctrines that we all believe, start there. Now, there's, it's not complete but it will give you a really good foundation and Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome he didn't plant this church he didn't know necessarily this church they they believe that um, the the thing that happened was there was somebody at Pentecost from Rome that gave their lives to Christ in that moment in that sermon that Peter preached went back and then they planted this church but Paul is wanting to partner with them He's wanting them to be like an outpost where he can go on his way to Spain and stop. And, but he wants to make sure that they understand that what he believes is the same thing that they believe. And so that's why you have this super deep, theologically rich letter. And he talks about sin, salvation, sanctification, sovereignty, and how all of that stuff kind of works together to the best of his knowledge and the best of our knowledge. And so, um, But as he always does, he shifts gear in chapter 12. And he says, okay, now that we've laid this foundation Here's what you do with it. Here's how you live. And so let's just look at these two verses. And we're going to go like literally word for word. But verse 1 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. So right out of the gate, he says, therefore. Anytime you see therefore in Scripture, it means he is referring backwards. And so what Paul is saying is in light of the truth, that he has laid out in the first 11 chapters, here's what we are to do. And so he says, therefore, brothers and sisters, this is a term of endearment, right? Many times I think we read the Bible like it was written to lost people. And it is written to lost people, but Paul is writing this letter to the church, to people who know him. And so he is saying, brothers and sisters, I, I, I put it like if I had a friend of mine that was making a bad decision, I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Like, that's just kind of where I go with that thought. So, but what that does is he's saying, look, this has a lot of weight to it. Like, this isn't just something I'm writing. Like, man, I really want you to pay attention to what I'm fixing to tell you to do. And he says, in view of the mercies of God. So he said, in light of the fact that there's mercy that we receive, he's unpacked that in the first 11 chapters. If you look at the Greek for mercies, It's kind of this idea of had compassion on. And so it's almost like he's saying, look, in light of the compassion God has shown us, I really want you to pay attention to this. And then he says, I urge you. Now the KJV says beseech, which is interesting because I've never used the word beseech in a a sentence, but it probably is the best, one of the best ways to capture what Paul is really saying. But it's this idea to call to one's side. And the Greek word is actually parakaleo, and if you're a Greek nerd like me, that word is very close to the word for Holy Spirit, which is paraclete. And that's when Jesus promises the helper, he calls it the paraclete, meaning that he will come alongside us. And so what Paul is saying is, look, we have a relationship, and in light of what I have written to you, I want you to come alongside me. I want you to come up next to me. It's not a demanding shove it down your throat it's a grace field hey come alongside me as we take this next step and he says to present your your translation may say offer and the greek there means to place a person or thing at one's disposal 
Now, here's what I love about that. It's not like to let them sort of have control, right? It's kind of like when my four-year-old wants to push the buggy at Walmart, I have to hang on to it because otherwise she'll run into people. But that's not what this is saying. This is saying that I would just let her take full control. And, and what Paul is saying is that he wants us to present something totally, to let go of it. But he says, present your body. And so the, the Greek is actually the physical body. This means that our faith and what he is fixing to instruct us to do and what he was instructing them to do is not just a mere spiritual thing. It is physical. It means that we take the body God has given us and we actually use it for his glory. We don't just keep it inside. Like We don't just make our little faith as our little faith. No, it, it encompasses what we do. But he says we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, if you've been around church very much, you've heard this verse. You've probably read this verse. You've probably heard a sermon preached on this verse. But for them in this original context, they knew what a sacrifice was. They would go out and they would pick the animal that was going to be sacrificed and they would carry it, walk it, whatever, to the temple and they would watch it be sacrificed. So there was a deep connection to this idea of sacrifice. And he doesn't just say be a sacrifice, he says be a living sacrifice sacrifice. And what's interesting, if you look at the Greek for sacrifice, um, we're going to jump back to Matthew 9, 13. Um, you don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, the Pharisees were all about the outward, uh, you know, sacrifices they could do, all these things. And, um, but what he is quoting is, is if you go back to Hosea chapter 6, the prophet Hosea says, For I desire faithful love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So even way back in Hosea, he is changing the paradigm of a sacrifice. And here's what I think is amazing, because he says the very next, holy and pleasing to God. Like What became holy and pleasing to God was something different than what it used to be, although God doesn't change, this was all part of his plan but in the Old Testament, for the sacrifice, you would take something living and make it dead for atonement. And now what he wants to do is take something who's dead and make it alive. Because what Jesus did when he went to the cross is he lived the life that we could never live. And he died the death that we deserve. But when he rose on the third day, he conquered death, he conquered sin. He completely conquered the sacrificial system. And now all of a sudden, what Paul is telling us is no longer are we called to take something alive and make it dead for the glory of God. We are to be acknowledging the fact that we are spiritually dead, but we are made alive in Christ and we live our life for his glory. And it's holy and pleasing to God. Now we talk about sacrifice and I think a lot of times we over-spiritualize that word. Now the, the sacrifice of Christ is by far the greatest sacrifice that ever happened. But in essence, sacrifice simply means exchange, right? Like I exchange five bucks for some coffee at Starbucks with some heated up milk in it, right? That's what we do. We exchange time to come to church. You know, you exchange money in your bank account to pay your mortgage or rent. Like we just exchange those things. Those are sacrifices. But here's where I think this should hit us kind of hard, kind of the way that Paul does a lot of times. He says, this is your true worship. So you can come to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, but what truly reflects whatever it is that you're worshiping is how you sacrifice your life. Meaning, every day we have 24 hours in a day, and we sacrifice the time in that day for something. Right? We, we exchange it for something. And at the end of the day, whatever we exchanged our life for that day, what Paul is saying, what I believe to be 100% true, is well, that's what we worship. Whether it's the approval of other people, whether it's money, whether it's status, whether it's relationships, whether whatever it is, whatever we sacrifice our life for is what we worship. And I think a lot of times we, I, I tried to find an hourglass because I think we, we, we just act like, okay, this day's over, I'm going to flip it back over. And, and we do get more, but at the end of the day, like you can't get the 24 hour previous hours back. And so what Paul is saying is like, look, in light of the truth of the gospel, in light of the truth of who you are, who God is, who Christ is, 
what he did, you should, I keep wanting to say offer, you should present your body as a living sacrifice. You should present it to him. You should worship him with your life. And it's not just like Sundays and Wednesdays, right? He's talking totally every moment, every day, how am I, how am I worshiping Christ with my life? And so if we're going to have to, if we're going to balance this truth life reset, the first thing we got to do is reset the proper response to the truth of the gospel. It's not just heaven and hell. Man, we, we equate following Jesus to just getting out of hell, and that is so, so short of what God has for us. It is so much more. The greatest thing about heaven is not that it's not hell. It's that Christ is there. So a friend of mine um, was a mentor in my life, and uh, when I first got saved, we were in his life group, and I still talk to him on a daily basis. We have a, a discipleship sort of relationship. We use an <laughs> app called Marco Polo. If you know what that is, it's a video app, but it's just a chat back and forth. And every morning I say, hey, this is what God taught me, and he says, hey, here's what God taught me. And, but, and, and you know, I'll never forget when we moved up here, we had kind of lost touch, um, we moved up here, and my wife got a phone call, and I remember the tears welling up in her eyes, realizing that he had had an affair, and it had kind of broke to the surface. And, and so, but since then, the Lord has restored their marriage and done amazing work in his life. But when I look at his life, I can see somebody in the beginning who was totally devoted to offering his sacrifice to look like a Christian. Right? He was sacrificing his body to look like a Christian. He, it's like he put on the uniform every day. But there was, and he was a believer. I don't think he wasn't a believer. But there was just, there was no intimate relationship with Christ. And now I see a guy who has completely repented of that and now is passionately pursuing Jesus and is daily offering his life as a sacrifice. And so there is a change that happens when we come to know Jesus and we begin to actually pursue him. And what the change for this guy was is that he believed the truth of the Bible. Truth, when we acknowledge that it is the truth, when we acknowledge that the Bible is the truth, will change us. But until we do that, we will just pick out bits and pieces that we want to be true but it will not transform us. So it begs the question, okay, how do I do that though? How do I, how do I begin to shift my life to where I actually am offering my body as a living sacrifice? And Paul, as he always does, gives us a really, really good example in verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So he's got a do not, and then he says, but do this. So the first thing he says, do not be conformed. Um, the word conform there means to contour yourself to another pattern. You know, I think that what Satan would love more than anything is for everybody in the church to look just like everybody outside of the church. If I'm being honest, there's many times in my life that if somebody came around and they followed me, like I don't know if they would just automatically know that I love Jesus because I allow myself to be conformed. And what Paul is saying is don't do that. Do not be conformed. And that's what the world is constantly trying to get us to do. But he says to this age. And that's a word that is very important because he's not just saying like we think about culture, right? Like don't be conformed to the culture. And what he's saying is it's not just the culture. It is everything that makes up the world and the sinful fallenness that it is. It is the beliefs, it is the philosophy, it is the worldview, it is all of those things wrapped up. And what, what I think we have to be really careful of is at times we can conform to one of those things. Right? I'm going to conform to this thing, but I'm still going to believe this truth over here. I'm going to conform to this thing, and I'm going to be this truth over here. And at the end of the day, before we know it, we have conformed to the world. But he says, rather than that, be transformed which simply means to be changed into another form. Let me just tell you that transformation is part of the life of the believer. If your life does not look different than it did before you knew Jesus, then I would question if you know Jesus. 
I know that's a harsh statement maybe or blunt or whatever you want to label it as, but that's just the reality. Like the truth of Scripture transforms us. And in my 11-year-old and in my 14-year-old, I can see it. I can see transformation happening. And so if you don't have that transformation, you've got to examine your relationship with Christ as if it's, if it's what you think it is. But he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When he says mind, he's talking about thoughts, feelings, purposes, desires. Um, you know, our, those things in our life, those thoughts, purposes, desires should look differently than the world. And we're never going to be perfect. I have lots of desires that are, <laughs> that are worldly, you know, like lots of things that I want. Um, I'm a truck guy, I always want a new truck. Or I'm a phone guy, I always want a new phone. Like my wife will attest to those things, right? But what, I'm, what Paul is saying is that we should not be known as somebody who is always being conformed to the, letting our mind be conformed to what the world says we need. But it says by the renewing of your mind, and here's what I love about this word renewing. It can also be translated as renovate. And before, when I was in seminary, I worked with a guy, and we did renovations. And when I first started, I was just a guy that was sweeping and mopping the floors. And, uh, but I was thankful. I had a job. You know, I was doing ministry. And, and, but then it moved to the demo guy. I was the demo guy, right? And if you're going to renovate something, you have to tear out the old before you can put in the new. Right? I know there's some flooring applications where you put stuff on top of it, but for the most part, like if I'm going to renovate a room and I need to make that room bigger, I have to tear out the old wall. And what I think Paul is saying is like if you're going to pre present your body as a living sacrifice, then you have to allow the old things in your brain be ripped out. And it's not fun. right? It's fun doing demolition, but it's not fun being demoed. But I've been there. I've been there when God came in and he had to rip out the things in my life that were not good, that were not truth. And so we have to allow ourselves to be open to being renovated in our mind. But it's not for us. It's not for us because what he says is so that, anytime you see so that, that's a purpose clause. So it's important. I, I like to highlight so that phrases in my Bible. So that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And so what Paul is saying is like, look, if you will do this, right, you will present your body as a living sacrifice, and you will not be conformed but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, you will be able to discern what is the good, perfect, and pleasing will of God. And what happens when we do that? When we begin to walk in that lifestyle, when it begins to become evident that we are followers of Jesus, then as we discern the will of God, then people see that in us. And all of a sudden they're drawn to that because it's like there's something different about that person. And so ultimately it's for the glory of God. But it does allow us to make better decisions, right? How many times in your life have you been like, is this God's will, right? Like, is this God's will? Like, is, it, is this car that I want to buy, is this God's will? You know, if God's calling us to move halfway around the world to be a missionary, is this God's will? And I can tell you, if you're not presenting your body as a living sacrifice and you're letting yourself be conformed to the world, you're going to struggle to find that answer. Now, God is gracious and he is sovereign and he will do what he does. But the more we can press into that idea of I'm going to present my body as a living sacrifice, everything I do is to glorify God, then the more likely we will be able to discern what is his will. So the second thing we're going to do if you're going to reset this truth life balance is you've got to renovate your mindset. So one of the things that I struggle with is feeling good enough just to be candid. And even with my relationship with the Lord, a lot of times I feel like I need more of him speaking to me. But the problem is I tend to equate him speaking to me to big mountaintop moments, right? Stuff like church camp and all these things, which are great things, but I, I've, I'm looking for him, and I'm looking for these big moves of God. But I feel like over the last year or two, like the Lord has really renovated my mind, where, like if I'm sitting in a meeting, 
And if I want to feel good enough, well, then the struggle is if I give an idea and it gets shot down, there's an automatic temptation to feel not good enough. But the Holy Spirit inside of me says, it just wasn't a good idea. There's nothing about you that nobody likes. And I can choose in that moment to either believe what the truth is or the lie that Satan's telling me. And when I believe the truth, that is transformation happening right there in that moment. The fact that you're sitting in this room right now, I believe, is proof that God is transforming you. Even if you would say you're an atheist and you're here because you came with a friend, I believe God is transforming you because he brought you here. When you're driving in traffic and you don't lose your cool at the person that cuts you off, I think that's transformation. And I think the more we can recognize those small little things, the more we can stand on them and push forward into our faith. Because I'm not waiting for the big, huge move of God. I'm seeing it day in and day out. I worked for the guy I was talking about and, and we were working on a screen door and it was a custom order door that had a custom color screw and we were one short. And this guy took this bag and he carried this bag everywhere. There's, there's no way there was going to be a screw in there and he flipped it over. A bunch of stuff fell out right in the middle. Nothing else around it was a screw that was green. He said, that's the Lord taking care of us right there. And he was right. And the more we can look for those, that's, that's to me, when I think about letting my mind be renovated, that's what I think about. I want to see those little moves of God day in and day out and grab a hold of them. And so our ultimate goal, like you're looking for a purpose statement for your life, I think it would be Romans 12.1. It's to offer your body as a living sacrifice. But it's so that people will come to know Christ. It'll so that people will glorify God. I think that it's easy to lose sight of the fact that we should be burdened that there are people in this world that don't glorify the God that created them. And that should be part of that motivation. And so Paul goes on in the next few verses, and I'm not going to dig into them, but I'm just going to give you a little snippet. But he goes on to say, okay, if you want to do these things, like here's what I'm going to tell you next is I'm going to talk about spiritual gifts and how you can serve in the church. And I promise I'm not just trying to plug in service, but it's right there. Like if you're looking for the next step for you to maybe as a believer, how do I offer my body or present my body as a living sacrifice? Well, what Paul would say is serve in the local church. You've got a gift. God gave it to you. Use it. Go serve. That's what he would want for you. And so, how do we respond, though? What do we do, um, you know, like, how do we take this truth, the truth of Romans 1 through 11, the truth of Romans 12, 1 and 2, and then move out the doors differently than we came in? Because one of the things I want to challenge you with, we talk about having a time of response. And, and I think that is amazing. We had two people come forward to pray to know Christ. But I also want you to know that everybody should respond. Doesn't mean you come forward. But you've, we, we've all heard the gospel and the truth proclaimed, which means we should respond somehow. Whatever that is for you, I don't know. But, you know, the reality is that everybody in this room, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice to something. You do. At the end of the day, you can look back over your day, and maybe it's approval, maybe it's a job, maybe it's money, maybe it's status, maybe it's a relationship. You are presenting your body as a living sacrifice to something. There is no middle ground, and it's either going to be Jesus or not Jesus. And if it's not Jesus, it's sin. And if you don't know Jesus, you're naturally going to offer your body to sin. That's just how we're wired. And so what Paul has spelled out in the first 11 chapters of Romans is meant to drive us into a deeper and intimate relationship with Christ. That's the goal. The goal is to push us into that intimate relationship with Jesus. And so what I think you have to ask yourself, though, what I have to ask myself is, do I have a deep and personal relationship with Jesus, or do I have a relationship with the idea of Jesus? Right? Do I love Jesus, or do I love the idea of Jesus? Because I would dare to say if the life that you live does not reflect the truth of the Bible, then maybe it's an idea thing that you love. Because truth is truth regardless of circumstances, 
right? It, the, that sign that was on the road could care less that I had a car full of guys and we were going to do something fun. That was the truth. The truth of Scripture does not change regardless of our circumstances. And honestly, there's freedom in that. I don't have to worry about that then. All of a sudden, now I can dig in and lean in. I don't have to stress over those things. But I think if the life that we live doesn't resemble the truth of the gospel, and one way I could just really challenge us all, myself included, is does, does your faith encompass more than Sundays and Wednesdays? Or is it just Sundays and Wednesdays? Because if it's just Sundays and Wednesdays, then I think you have to ask yourself, do you really believe the truth? And maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Because, see, I think the, the thing that, one of the things that I think is, I don't know the word, honestly, to, to even describe what I'm, but I think if Jesus came back right now, in this moment, in our country, there would be churches where the pews would still be full of people. Because they love the idea of Jesus. They love the idea of going to heaven. But they have not accepted the truth of the gospel, that it is all-encompassing. That we are sinners who cannot reconcile to our Creator apart from our relationship with Jesus. And I don't say that to make people doubt their faith. I say that because that was my story. When I was in fourth grade, I heard a sermon. And it, it just it scared me to death. I went forward. I did not want to go to hell. And the pastor said, and I'm not knocking the pastor. You want to go to heaven or hell? But I didn't want to go to hell. So he led me in a prayer and I got baptized the next Sunday. And for the next 10 years of my life or however long, I don't even know how long it was, my only perception of having a relationship with Jesus meant going to church on Sundays. That was it. And I lived, and I, I offered my body as a living sacrifice to a lot of things, to sports, to my relationship with my wife now, to um, very unholy things. And it led me into a path of addiction in 2005. But in 2006, I realized that I was not offering my life as a sacrifice and I put my faith and trust in Christ and it's never been the same and but I sat in a church pew every Sunday for a decade and the invitation would come and I would be like oh man do I know I need to know that I know that I know and I didn't and it wasn't until I went through a really dark season that God revealed to me that I had loved the idea of the truth of scripture but I had never grasped and accepted the truth of scripture and so that was my story. But here's the thing. I don't want to end on a downer. I did the last sermon, but I added this. Praise God that he wants us to know the truth. Praise God that he doesn't want us to walk around in darkness. He doesn't want us to walk around hoping. He wants you to know that you know him. He is not a God of confusion. That is a good thing. That is the grace of God. So how do you respond? For some of you, you heard the truth of the gospel for the first time today. And maybe you've sat in church pews for years, but you've heard it in a new way. And all that, all that you need to do is get saved. You need to accept the truth of Scripture. You can come forward in just a minute, and you can talk to one of our uh, pastors up here. We had two guys come forward in the last service and, and accept the truth of the Scripture. But there's probably a lot of us in this room that are just like me. We just need to repent. Like, one of the things that happens when I preach is I always have to repent. Like, I could have probably stayed up all night repenting because of the sin in my life. But if, if your life doesn't reflect the truth of the gospel, that's sin. And the only proper response to sin is repentance. And so what that means is that it's time to repent. Maybe, maybe you don't have to come forward. You can do that right where you are. You just say, God, I'm sorry. I acknowledge the fact that I have not been living according to Romans 12.1. But I want to, and I confess that. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that there are some people who are not fully engaged in the life of the church because they've been hurt. And I'd be remiss to just skim past that because I've been hurt. Not by church people either. I mean, I have been hurt by church people, but what I'm saying is I've been hurt by church staff. And I know what it's like. And my encouragement to you would not be to just grit, grit and bear it but would be to get in a relationship with people that you can be open and honest and work through it. Because I think the biggest thing that helps us actually 
see that we are being transformed is to be in a discipleship relationship. I like to call these PT groups, Paul and Timothy groups. We all need a Paul, we all need a Timothy. And, and you hear me, I talk about it a lot. I've got a group, we meet Wednesday mornings at 5.30. And those guys know everything about me, no secrets. And I know everything about them. And so maybe for you, your next step is to say, I'm done just sitting in a pew. I'm going to go get into a group where I'm really honest and allow the word of God to transform you. And we can help with that. Maybe you need to be in a group. Maybe you need to be, be, become a member. Last thing I'll say before we close, too. Maybe you need to be baptized. Like, I, I, I had to get my baptism on the right side of my salvation. And there's nothing special about the water up there. It just comes out of the tap. But there is something amazing about getting your baptism on the right side of your salvation. God works miraculous things in that. And so if you would, just bow your head and close your eyes as we close. The reality is, is I, I'm confident there are people here that need Jesus. Whether you've been in church your life or not, I don't know. But and my encouragement to you would be to take that step of faith and come forward. Ask God to come in and change your life. He's faithful and just to do so. Maybe you just need to pray and repent. And you can do that where you are. You can, uh, you can come forward and talk to one of our staff. You can come kneel at the altar, whatever it is. And you just need to repent of the fact that you've been offering your life as a sacrifice to something other than Christ. Maybe you need to join a church. You've never officially joined a church family, and that's a big part of the commitment that we uh, believe that is call, the calling of the Christian. And so you can come forward. We can help you do that. Maybe you need to get baptized. Maybe you've just been sitting in the pew on Sunday mornings, and you know that you need to serve or you need to be in a group, and you just need help. And You can do that here. You can go to Next Steps, and that'll help you do that as well. But whatever it is, I just, I want you to respond. I think we all have a response. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, your word is true. It is the truth. And God, I pray that it would transform us more into the image of your son. And that's going to look different for everybody in this room. But God, all that matters is that you're at work. I do pray that we would all begin to recognize the little things how you work and move in the moments that no one else is watching and no one else can hear what we're saying in our own brains. But God, help us to stand on those moments. So Father, we give you this time and we ask that you would move in our hearts in Jesus' name.